today on a special rambling about cars, we have more horsepower with Range Rover, more lift with Chevrolet, more money from Volkswagen, a lot more money. Wow. And we have a very special guest to talk about Scout Motors and what could be coming here. Some, some, maybe some little hints, some teasers. You want to check it all out? Stick with us. It's time to roll podcast time. I am Christopher Smith. And I'm a little off because this is my first day back from a little bit of a vacation. So co-host Chris Bruce, help me out here today. Yeah, thanks for having thanks for having me. I'm always here. Why am I saying that? <laughs> you might, I was on vacation. What am I doing? You're supposed to be spot on. I'm still supposed I to be la, la la la. Anyway, our guest this week is Tim Stevens. Tim wrote a fantastic piece yes. for us uh, interviewing Chris Benjamin, who is the head of design at Scout Motors. And so we will be talking about that in the second half of the show. But Tim, go ahead, introduce yourself to the folks. Tell them sure. what, what, whatever you would like to tell people about yourself. Open mic. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Thanks, Christopher. Uh, very glad to be here. Uh, yeah, so I am these days a freelance uh, journalist focused mostly on automotive, but doing some tech stuff too. Before that, I ran uh, CNET's automotive coverage, uh, ran some of you might remember from Roadshow um, back then for about uh, just about 10 years I was at CNET actually. Mm. Um, again, really focused on leading their automotive coverage there and uh, had a lot, of, a lot of fun there. And before that, I was the editor-in-chief of a um, tech site called Engadget back in the, the early glory days of uh, wow. of blogging, kind of a, the, the tech sister blog to autoblog back in the day. So um, that was my, um, that was kind of my entry into the tech blogging world. And then, yeah, I pivoted from there to automotive and uh, and now I'm doing the freelance thing. So really lucky to be writing for, for size, I like Motor One, but to doing some contributions for Motor Trend, Road and Track, Car and Driver, and a bunch of other places too. Very awesome. Cool. All, all very good sites. And I remember Engadget way back in the day. Um, what, wasn't there around what, what, was, like, wasn't there a little yeah. am i mistaken in thinking there was a little collaboration with like the old tech tv and like the original g4 days what wasn't there a little bit going on there or, or am i thinking uh, of something else yeah we certainly did a lot of uh kind of a uh, cross promotion of editors that kind of thing there wasn't any official partnership or anything like that but certainly you know i did a lot of uh, uh appearances with leo laporte on his show and that kind of thing back in those days too and actually i used to freelance for g4 tv way back in the day i used to be a writer for x play um back in oh, the okay. really around nice. probably around 2003 2004 so i, I that okay. was actually i kind of got my start in journalism doing video game reviews back in the late 90s actually so yeah i, I used to write Ooh. for x play a very long time ago so, so, so was Adam that X Play and Morgan Webb, right? Exactly. Yep. Yep. The, the original X Play. So uh, I okay. mostly did strategy game reviews for them back in the day, plus th th come, uh, racing games as well, of course, because I've always been a big racing game fan. Uh, but yeah, I wrote for them and um, uh, nice. Yahoo Games back in the day, and uh, and yeah, I got my start in journalism literally because I was one of the few people who owned the Sega Saturn, and there was a website <laughs> called Gaming Target at the time that <laughs> nice. was looking for people to do. Uh, reviews of Sega Saturn games. It was like nobody had one. Like, hey, I I have one, and I can put two sentences together. So uh, that was my nice. first okay. uh, first freelance gig way back when I was in college in the late nineties. Okay, yeah, Very gosh, cool. Ty we could time's gone lot, by, man. <laughs> well, we, we could. I was a, I was a big fan of the reborn G four. I was sad to see it go away that yeah, quickly. Really doing I, too long. I, I felt like they were just you know the new crew. I felt like they were just starting to kind of gel, and then but. Yeah, people don't tend to have a lot of patience for um, endeavors, which is kind of crazy to me, given the amount of uh, resources it would take to bring something like that back. Um, but yeah, there are so many great editorial brands that come out and do really cool stuff, and and they just start to find their legs, and then uh, the rope gets pulled out from under. It's like That's, nope, or the rug, yep. rather. So. You're not you're not an instant success, so away mm -hmm. you go. Thank mm -hmm. God, Bruce, that hasn't happened for us yet because we're still not a success. We've been doing this podcast for like <laughs> two don't years. Tell the people that they don't need to know we're not a success. <laughs> Well, wait, we're, maybe we're a success. We're maybe a partial success. No, we're not a success. And Tim, I tried to lowball a guy I went to high school with to get his Sega Saturn because I wanted one. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I was not willing to buy one new, but it was that after the worse, Saturn had died, like by a, a couple of years after the Saturn had died. Mm -hmm. And I was really tried to lowball him and get one and i was unsuccessful i do own a dreamcast though so nice well, i mean right. if, I mean, if we're going to talk a little gaming this this older computer that's behind me that you can't really see i oh, somehow I over my vacation managed to get jane's world war ii fighters loaded on wow. so this is like so that's like a 20 year old flight yeah sim. that's going back i'm Every more of a I'm, I'm more of a modern computer with, with mm -hmm. i mean it's running windows 8 but I was just in heaven. It's like the graphics are kind of dated, but 
<laughs> this is like so smooth. Look at me flying it. Anyways, well, we're, we're a little rambly today. We'll just talk you know, about video games. Talk, but <laughs> I, I will talk video games all day, every day. So no problem. Yeah. There. Um, but we should, we probably should ramble about some cars. I'm thinking we should, we should. Um, do we want to start with the Colorado? Does that sound good? Yeah. Let's, let's start with the Chevrolet Colorado. Um, all right, then let me throw some, if, if for no other here. reason, if for no other reason, then, okay. I mean, it's the Chevrolet Colorado ZO ZR2, you know, it, you love it. Maybe you hate it. Maybe you hate it. I don't know, but there's now the bison version that we knew was coming and it's just a bigger, beefier ZR2. Um, of course, it's got all the upgrades on it from American Expedition vehicles, the AEV stuff. So right. you get so I, I, I well, mm -hmm. I wanted to mention that real quick, because just the other week, you and I were talking about the GMC Canyon AEV edition, a, the Canyon yep. AT4X AEV, you know, um, the, the, yeah, yeah, lots of lots uh, of letters and numbers. And it's interesting that we got a teaser for that vehicle, but this kind of came out of nowhere. Um, and I thought it was interesting that there were no real teasers for this, anything like that. It just, you know, Chevy just kind of put it out, whereas we got teasers for the GMC version. And presumably, since, you know, they're riding on the same platform and they're such similar vehicles, mm -hmm. I, I would have to imagine that there's going to be a lot of similarities between the two of them. And I love the group FBC. Thanks for joining us again. I love that you're giving me flashbacks to Iron Man Ivan Stewart's off road. Mm -hmm. What a perfect blend of video games and the topic at hand right now. <laughs> I mean, could you could you just see this like like you're in an arcade? It's 1987, 1988, and you're driving a little Chevrolet Colorado ZR2 Bison, and you didn't even know what it was back then, but here it is now. That would have been a great marketing effort for them, actually, to like do a web version of, of that game where you can drive the new Bison around and, uh, and race against, uh, I don't know, like like a, uh, a Tacoma or something like that as well. That'd be a lot of fun. It would that, be. That, that would be inspired marketing. I would be on board for that. <laughs> um, so I went to college in the early 2000s and the laundromat at my college or the, the laundromat at my college in there, they still had Ivan Iron Man Stewart's off-road. And I play, I put probably more quarters into that than I did in the washing machine. Oh, that's how you win the game. You just keep dumping the quarters in. And then, I mean, you just, you just keep hitting the nitros. You bounce off the wall. You don't steer. You just like sling the wheel once and let yep. it spin around. So, God, the momentum that was so on there. fun. You just, you just spin that wheel and it goes around and around and around and around. And like, oh, that's such a fun. Turns game. out if you do that in real life. Not a good thing. <laughs> I, I highly, I highly recommend not doing that. Even if you have a ZR2 Bison with an extra 1.5 inches of ground clearance, you get a little bit more ground clearance. Of course, you get the multimatic and that's above ZR2, dampers which is already lifted. So yeah, that's above yeah. the ZR2. Mm -hmm. um, you get the upgraded front and rear jounce dampers. You get power locking front and rear differentials. There are upgraded front and rear bumpers. It's interesting when you look at the approach and departure angles, the breakover angles, the stuff that off-roaders really look into, but most other people don't. Mm -hmm. Your approach angle on the ZR2 Bison is actually a little worse because of the bumper a they tad. put on the front. Just a tad mm -hmm. worse. The breakover right. and the departure angles are a little bit better. Um what is it? 12.2 inches of ground clearance all total. It is a little heavy. It's 5,265 pounds. That's, I mean, we're talking a mid-sized truck. It's, it's kind of a beefy truck. Yeah, it's getting 300 um, pounds over the ZR2, which which I think was the thing that stood out to me the most, um, especially when we're talking about no real power upgrades. Uh, that was a little bit yep. disappointing, I think, that um, if there was one kind of criticism about uh, Bison ZR2, it was really on the power front. You know, there's so much... Everyone's throwing so much power at trucks and, and SUVs these days with the, the Raptor and Raptor R and stuff like that. Um, that was a little bit disappointing to me, given the extra power, that there, or excuse me, given the extra weight that there was um, no extra fiddling done on that end. No, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned yeah. that because, yeah, it's the engine. This is the same top tier engine you can get in any top tier Colorado. Um, it's the 310 horsepower, 430 pound feet of torque, the 2.7 liter turbo four. Um, for something like this, I mean, I know. I know Chevrolet isn't aiming this to be uh, like a Ranger Raptor competitor, mm -hmm. no. um, but I mean, suspension wise, they're certainly billing it as something a little bit extra than your average Colorado. It feels like a little extra power to help offset the extra weight would be, would be called for here. So I'll be interesting to see how 
um, how Chevrolet buyers and, and off-road enthusiasts kind of take to this. Yeah, I, I, I agree. It's it, it's always that thing. It's kind of the same thing we were talking about with the AV edition, AEV edition of the Canyon. And mm-hmm. that is just that, you know, it, you, you get to, you know, you've got the ZR2 and then you have the Bison on top of that. And so, mm-hmm. and then you have, you know, lesser versions uh, uh, below that, that, you know, you're, I feel like you start getting fewer and fewer customers as you go more and more hardcore. Like the, only a certain person is going to be willing to spend the extra money to buy this truck. And I should say, we don't know the price yet, but we know the standard ZR2 is $48,295. And this is definitely going to be more than that just because of the extra equipment. So, right. I mean, this is all a 50 grand. So I seem safe to guess. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point, Bruce. Um, very specific buyer for this truck because 50 large, there are a lot of other decent full size trucks, um, that wouldn't be any slouch off road. This is obviously going to be a little bit different with its uh, upgraded suspension with its higher ride height, but it certainly, it's going to command a premium. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it, it should be a fun toy, though. I mean, it looks really incredibly capable. Um, it's still reasonably practical. I think it tows 50, uh, 5,500 pounds. So that's, that's you know, fair. Uh, and the, about 1,000 pounds payload, too. So it's still, you know, a, a reasonably productive truck. You can definitely get some work done with it. Um, but for sure, people are going to be buying these as toys. And, uh, and yeah, I'm uh, I'm curious to get to drive one. I think it'll be a lot of fun. And I'm, I'm, I am I got to say, I do appreciate and I do enjoy these um you know, more specialized trucks and SUVs that are coming out, whether it be, you know, the various flavors of Bronco that um, the Ford has released um, to basically focus on if you want to do high speed off road, do you want to do mud and do you want to do that kind of thing? And I, I kind of enjoy that um, that the market is expanding enough that, that people can kind of pick and choose and find the right product that's right for them. Although, of course, so many people in this segment really just want to buy kind of a basic truck and then go crazy in the options and do their own thing with the aftermarket packages. Um, but still, it's a great looking truck and should be should be a lot of fun, I think. Yeah, so, I mean, I guess uh, I go, go, go ahead. Go ahead, Bruce. Go ahead. Well, no, I, I'm, I'm just, just going to go say, down opinion road here and, and maybe maybe <laughs> we shouldn't. I was going to say, listener Eric Nefron asked, how does it compare to a Gladiator? And Eric, I'll be totally honest with you. I do not have Gladiator specs pulled up at this very moment to be able to answer that question super, super intelligently. But I would say something like, you know, uh, once you get to the Gladiator Rubicon or Mojave or trims like that, they're all oh, kind of in that same. Oh, yeah. Pr- price rise. It'll, it'll be right there with a with a specced up Gladiator. It, it'll, it'll be right there with a spec up. Well, I, I, I was thinking more in terms of, you know, capabilities and stuff like that, too, that it's, you know, it all of those trucks are kind of aiming for the same buyer. You could, you know, uh, Tim, you mentioned the Ranger Raptor that we just saw, what, two weeks ago, something like that. You know, they're all kind of aiming for that same group of buyers. And it basically comes down to what do you want you know what do you have a brand preference is there something about a specific truck that gets you um eric i'll be totally i feel like i'm answering your question poorly just because i don't have gladiator specs in front of me but um yeah there's, but, I mean, there's certainly competitors it, it's an astute question and consider where we are now versus maybe i mean just three or four years ago look at what we have for a, basically a, a mid-sized truck segment now um where we have uh, a hopped up Chevrolet Colorado, the ZR2 Bison. We will mm-hmm. soon have the hopped up uh, GMC Canyon AEV. Um, mm-hmm. There is the Jeep Gladiator. Ranger Raptor. We now Tacoma have the Ranger Raptor. Trail Hunter or the, the new Pro. The new Trail Hunter. This midsize segment, especially the, the I'll, I'll say the more off road focus version of it. I mean this this is this is fairly new territory here. I mean it's. If, if you're into that segment, it's an exciting time. But this is where I kind yeah. of veered veered down that opinion road a little bit. It's like, well, if we're talking about spending 50 or 55 grand for a truck, am I thinking midsize? And I don't know. I My answer on that is probably no, to be honest. Yeah, that, that's definitely a great point. I mean, you're well within uh, a nicely equipped F-150 if you want to or, or you know, Silverado or whatever you want to at that point. But really, I guess it depends on what you want, what you want to do. Yep. A bigger truck is not going to be better on the trails, of course. Um, and so 
Uh, if you want to go dune hopping, then that's a different thing. But if you're, you know, where I am, you know, the trails are mostly wooded and narrow and that kind of thing. So, mm-hmm. you know, something like this would probably be even better suited. But it, it really depends what, what you want to do. And I do like that, uh, you know, it wasn't that long ago that even finding a decent mid-sized truck was a challenge. And now we've got real specialty models like this yeah. that are available, which I think points to, to strength in the market, which is good. And certainly people are spending more and more on trucks. I forget what the average... Um, price of a truck is these days but it's it's it's, it's up, up there, there. It's, so it's um up there. up there yeah so i, I think that, that's something good that people have car is 45 46 i think the last time so, i yeah. saw an average vehicle mm-hmm. in general so. well i just and i just saw a report today i can't remember where it came from um i think one in six new car buyers right now are paying a thousand dollars a month for the car payment yeah yeah it's, one in six thousand uh, dollars a month I'm going to feed into that a little bit, I think, with our with our next uh, with our next topic. <laughs> you think the buyers of this vehicle are going to be paying a thousand dollars a month? <laughs> I, I, I don't. I, I, honestly, I hope not. If you have to pay a thousand dollars for your midsize truck, you need. I mean, make better financial decisions. That, that's my unsolicited well, advice. But our next vehicle here is the Land Rover Range Rover Sport SV. And so this is the new top of the heat version of the Range Rover Sport. It gets that uh, BMW source twin turbo 4.4 liter uh, V8 that they've been using in a lot of vehicles. In this application, it makes 626 horsepower, 590 pound feet of torque. And I forgot to mention this. It is mild hybrid equipped. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, it's not for efficiency, I don't think. (laughs) No, 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 no. It's, I it's, don't think so. It's, it's all about performance and damn it all. Every time I get my list of like the, the top 20 fastest SUVs, here comes another one. Now I got to go back and update my list again. Um, <laughs> but believe it or not, let me, let me talk about that list for a second. Um, yeah. the, this, this Range Rover Sport SV, Range Rover says zero to 60, Land Rover says zero to 60. 3.6 seconds, top speed of 180 miles an hour. That's seriously fast for anything, never mind an SUV. Yeah. And it's still on the very bottom end of the top 20 fastest SUVs, new SUVs in the world right now. Um, I think and I think the it, I think the cutoff is like three seven or three eight. And I had like a four-way tie at that point. So as as insane as this is, there are still, I mean, it's still at the bottom of that top 20. But I mean, come on. And it's not a light power. vehicle, 5,644 pounds. So it it's hauling some weight to get to that uh, zero to 60 in 3.6. Yep. But you can get 23 inch carbon fiber wheels. That oh, save you 78 pounds. So, you know, that that's really going to help on your 5,000 pound behemoth of an SUV <laughs> to get 78 pounds off your carbon fiber wheels, which will be thousands of dollars. And you can get carbon ceramic brakes, which will save another 70 something pounds too. So, you know, yep. very important that you save a little bit of weight down low to the ground. And you've got this giant uh, SUV body all on, over it. And and I'm glad you mentioned all of that. Sorry to you. The, no, no, that's the, no, that's no, just fine. We love it. I I need interrupting sometimes. <laughs> um, there's a carbon fiber hood also that you can get. Altogether, it can save 168 pounds. But consider consider this. If I'm if I'm describing a vehicle like this, okay, 626 horsepower, twin turbo, 4.4 liter V8 from BMW. Zero to 60 in three and a half seconds. It's got optional carbon fiber wheels, carbon ceramic brakes, carbon fiber hood. Um, We'll talk about the vibrating seats later, and I'm not kidding on that. Does it sound like I'm talking about a 5,200-pound SUV? Carbon ceramic yeah. brakes, carbon fiber wheels. But, yeah, I mean, what what a weird what a weird time to be in. So real quick, um, I always love to shout out whenever we have someone who I've seen comment for the first time. So we have a first time commenter, Brian Grant, Subaru should bring back the Baja. I have no idea what that has to do with either the Colorado or the Range Rover. But by God, do I agree with you, Brian? Brian might be a first time commenter. Actually, he's not a first time commenter. He's he's oh, carried he's over. He he's somebody that I that I know. If it's the same Brian Grant, it's somebody that I know. Very very astute on cars. Loves rambling about cars. So thank you, Brian, for chiming in. Um, has an owner of a Forester. I would agree. Let's bring back the Baja. But but let's for crying out loud, let's not give it an eighty thousand dollar price tag with six hundred <laughs> horsepower and vibrating seats and a wait for it. 
29 speaker, 1,430 watt stereo system. And I should mention that I just pulled the $80,000 price out of my backside because Range Rover, uh, there isn't a price listed for the Sport SV. And for right now, it's only available by invitation. The first, what they're calling the edition one, it's only going to be available by invitation. If they say, hey, you're a preferred customer, would you like to buy one of these? You'll have the opportunity. Beyond that, we have no information on pricing. I can just about guarantee it's going to be way more than 80 grand. Yeah, I'd say you probably need to bet double that. I think that's probably closer to the market, especially given there'll probably be some dealer premiums going on here. But um, but the last SV, SV was remarkable. I, I had a chance to drive that thing, and um, it was really, really good, both on-road and off-road. Um, so I fully expect that this one will be amazing. And the images that they dropped, it, it looks looks fun, really, really phenomenal. It looks amazingly cool, kind of subtle. Uh, I do like the kind of the, the greenish yellowish highlights that they've got on the calipers and things like that, but there's nothing really that's loud and brash about it, which I think is what I like no. the most. This is a really fast, really expensive, really high performance SUV that is, I don't want to say a sleeper exactly, but it is a pretty subtle looking machine. I think it looks fantastic. No, I, I think uh, I, it's I mean, hard to be a sleeper when it's, you know, the, not the necessarily of a house <laughs> in some areas, but, but hey, uh -huh. you, you don't, you don't. The, the guy in the next lane doesn't know that. And and to your point there, I, I would call this a sleeper if somebody that knows what it is uh, that they can pick out. So, oh, that's got the carbon fiber wheels. Okay, I know what that is. Or they might see the brakes. Okay, if you can find those details, mm -hmm. but but only a really a, an enthusiast, and even then. A, a Land Rover person will be the, will be the one that really picks that out. To everybody else, it's it's it'll it'll look like a you know a fancy Range Rover, and they're probably quick, but they're not as they're not as quick as my Corvette, or they're not as quick as my as my Mustang. And yeah, <laughs> you'll get surprised. It'll it'll surprise a few people. So Grupa FBC has the best comment of the night so far. Like ice cream, the SV is somewhat dumb and not good for me, but I want one. <laughs> yeah, very true. Very, very true. I, that's the best comment of the night so far. We you still know, have more cars to talk about. I mean, as, as I was just going over some of these stats, you know, because really we're talking about specialty vehicles here tonight. Um, the the Colorado ZR2 Bison, that's that's gonna that's definitely a specialty vehicle that's appealing yeah. to a very so, small. A segment uh range rover sport sv whether you want one or not it's only offered to a very specific segment by invitation only so and, and the then the vehicle we're going to talk about here later there's only 333 being made of them uh we'll get to that in a second but yeah we're talking about very very specialized vehicles and I'm wondering how many more specialized vehicles the world really needs. I guess as people start, I mean, as if people are buying them, people will mm -hmm. buy them. Virginia. You know, I'm. I mean, if if I had that kind of money to spend, I don't. Well, I shouldn't say that because I I would be I would be I would make really stupid decisions with that with that money. I probably wouldn't have one of these Range Rover Sports. I probably have like. 80 Mustang twos and then another 40 for parts. So I'm probably not the best one to, to judge on that. I'm always amazed that manufacturers can get away with having as many special cars as they do and them still being treated as special. I mean, every manufacturer is doing it at this point and, and, you know, you have to respect that brands can get away with it. And of course we all know why they do it. They can add on a, a list of desirable options that add some amount of cost for them, but that they can, you know, make a huge amount of profit margin on top of that. So that's why, that's why they do it, of course, but it, it remains to be seen, you know, how far can these brands kind of, um, uh, milking is maybe the wrong term, but maybe it's not the wrong term. Uh, you know, how far can they go? We've seen Lotus maybe pushing the envelope a little bit too far in previous generations. Hopefully they'll yeah. do a little bit better with new products and not just new sticker packages going forward. I, I think we, you know, we've all heard of the, the sticker package, special editions, that kind of thing. This to me feels like a really significant upgrade. So I think that this is fair for sure. Um, but there are certainly a lot of quote unquote special editions out there that are far from special. Agreed. Very, very good points all around. Um, I don't got nothing else to add on that. That's no, that, that, that uh, we need to have you. You should you should be co-hosting the show, Tim. <laughs> I, I, I Wait, that another couple weeks job, off. Smith? Are you are, are you firing me? <laughs> wow, that's harsh. Sorry that you had to find out this way. So, yeah. Sorry, no, no. If if anybody anybody's getting fired is me. 
Well, let's talk about another vehicle that the other special edition. So, mm-hmm. yeah, another mm-hmm. special edition. So far, this one is only for Europe, and it has an absolutely absurd price that we will get to in a moment. Uh, this is the Volkswagen Golf R333 limited edition. The 333 it references two things. First off, it has 333 metric horsepower, or Ferdstarke, as they say in Germany, and that translates to 328 horsepower for us American folks, and they are only making 333 of them. There's one more reference in there to 333. Please? It, it officially debuted, according, according to our boss, Adrian, it officially debuted in Germany at 3.33 p.m. today. Hmm. There you go. For for just just to make it complete, make it the trifecta, 3.33, 3.33. You think they would charge $333 for it? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no, they won't. <laughs> no. How about 76,410 euros, yeah. which what? for in U.S. currency – would equal eighty one thousand six hundred dollars in in current uh, current exchange rates. That is so, a lot of money for a golf man. That's, and that's a Volkswagen Golf. Now, uh, I I hate to become that old guy that says get off the lawn, but but we've had a but fifty thousand. We we've had a fifty thousand dollars successor to the Chevrolet S ten, and like it or not, the Colorado. It, it kind of picked up where the S10 left off, right? Yes. Am, am I wrong yes, there? That's so fair. We have a $50,000 S10 successor. Okay, we, we have the Range Rover Sport SV, which, I mean, that's that's properly super and, and just incredible performance. High-end luxury. We don't know what it's going to cost. It'll be a lot. But it, it's at least in, in sort of its own proper category. And now we have a Volkswagen Golf that's over $80,000 in U.S. currency. What is happening to the world? <laughs> what is happening? I, hey, limited edition, three hundred thirty-three um, power. I mean, it's it's this. It's pretty much the same power as as you get in regular in in the other special editions that they've done, right? So, uh, am I losing my mind here, or am I just am I just getting to be that age where it's just like, what's what's Why not wrong, both, Smith? What's wrong? What's wrong with the world? Certainly $80,000 equivalent, because we should say this has not been confirmed for the United States so far. This is a European only model. To me, if I'm looking into my crystal ball, I have to wonder if you do something like this for Europe, would you do something similar for the United States? You know, maybe we don't know yet, though, but it yeah, it's. Well, I, I mean, let's said, let's we should probably review what you're getting aside from okay, it's a limited edition model. They're only making 333, um, 480 watt stereo, 19 inch wheels. The speed limiter on this is bumped up, so it'll top out at 168 miles an hour, zero to 100 kilometers an hour, 62 miles an hour, 4.6 seconds. Um, the delivery start in October of this year, and yeah, right now, as far as we know, it's just European only. Of course, right. it's wearing that is wearing that that lime yellow exterior, which yeah, it's it's like a usually, highlighter yellow. Usually, mm-hmm. I'm just totally put off by these shades, but this one works for me, and I don't know why. Maybe it's because it's a golf, and I am a I am a golf fan. Um, Same that that shade with the black striping with the black accents. I think it's just cool as hell. And um, you didn't mention this; it gets an Akrapovich exhaust with titanium rear mm-hmm. silencers, which, yeah, which first off, sweet. Akrapovich exhausts always sound fantastic. And the fact that my my exhaust is titanium sounds cool as hell. And I mean, and, and Uki comments, glad they didn't make it six six six. I don't know. I think maybe this this would have been a better fit at six six six, but obviously for for reasons well known, they they wouldn't wouldn't make it that, but. This thing just seems kind of like just just like it's it has this evil streak or it wants to, you know, beat up your neighbor for you. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's interesting to me. This isn't the end of the Gulf R, right? They're, this is still continuing on to this kind of feels like a, an end of the road kind of special edition to me, um, because like I said, there's not really that much honestly special about it, except for the number on the dashboard, basically X of 
thirty three. Um, so you know, I'm I'm certainly not opposed to something like this, but it, it really feels like you know a final send off kind of special edition. Get the you know the last one of these, but I haven't heard that that the R is right. going away. So well, yeah, the timing of it seems a bit strange. It is a bummer that I, I don't think we're going to get this in the U.S. I'd be surprised if we do. We might get our own flavor. Um, am but, I uh, mistaken that we've heard the next gen golf is electric? Am I? I, I, I if I remember I swear correctly, I've seen if, that story. If, if if I remember correctly, I think I think that is the case. Don't don't one hundred percent quote me on that. And you're right, Tim. This does feel like a a final edition. Yeah. But I'm with you. We haven't heard anything that okay. This is this is it. This is going to be the mm-hmm. last. Um, it's right. just from what we gather right now, just another limited edition. Yeah, um, so but, sort of in the vein of the twenty years edition, right? Right, but the Golf R is is really great. Um, I I've actually oh, yeah. had a chance to spend quite a bit of time in in them. And it was interesting. I had one for a week, and I really actually didn't like it. Um, I just didn't connect with it for whatever reason. And then I had it for a second week. I, I got a second loan to do a review of it for for another outlet, and. Um, I took it out on a really rainy day and um, it just completely transformed my impression of the car because it was so tail happy and so happy to swing oh. the rear end down much more so than your average all wheel drive car. I'm a Subaru guy myself and, you know, so constantly fighting understeer usually. So how playful it was really kind of changed my mind on, on that car. So I could see, you know, there being the, the, the interest, certainly, you know, there's a lot of passionate love for, for Volkswagens out there. So I can see there being desirability of this. And speaking of Subarus, I went back and looked at the, um, the S209, because I remember when that version of the STI came out a couple of years ago, that was priced in the mid 60s. And everybody at that time said that's an outrageous amount of money for a Subaru who would spend $65,000 on a, a Subaru. I, I went to look at prices for those now, and they're going for the mid $90,000 um, used. <laughs> so I think if anything, if, or if nothing else, this is Volkswagen being well aware of, of you know, knowledge that, that these are going to be very desirable, and uh, so they might as well get their their cut. And of course, since these are being sold in Europe, they're, they're being sold directly by Volkswagen, so they don't have to worry about yeah. um, upcharges and that kind of thing, which is uh, a sad state of the world here in the U.S. Well, I mean, there's certainly no mistaking that a car as iconic as the as the Golf here, that's going to have a passion to following. Um, you're definitely playing on heartstrings here. I mean, consider consider like the original Type Two buses, just how inexpensive and utilitarian yeah. they were, but they struck a chord and you know, the, the really nice 23 window buses are easily six figures. Um, yeah, of course, I mean, we're not talking, we're not talking a 60 year old golf here, but in 60 years you have one of these limited editions. Yeah. No. So who, two who things I know? wanted to put point out real quick. First off, I have, I posted this, um, uh, you guys can see it. So Volkswagen golf electric is going to be, we're going to see it soon as a concept hasn't debuted mm-hmm. yet, but apparently okay. it's coming. And then, uh, Tim, as what you were saying, my little anecdote about that, I f- forget where the S 209 debuted, but I was at whatever auto show that was. And mm-hmm. I got one of the hats and gave it to my dad. So, um, I, I have to, the joke that I told him at the time is they probably made more of these hats than they did of the actual car. <laughs> so, yeah. That's an astute point. Um, and then let me just mention also some, some points here from Jay Ferrari. ADK opens up a lot of doors for options. Yeah. I mean, I don't think there's any argument of saying, okay, well I have $80,000 to spend. Do I want to buy, uh, you know, there, there, there are, I mean, you could, I think you can step into a, like a nice Cayman for for about eighty grand or a little bit yeah. less. Mm-hmm. Do I want to buy a Cayman or do I want to buy a Golf? But that's that's not really the point here. This is going to be focused at a very specific, passionate VW enthusiast who wants a limited edition vehicle. Um, you know, to, to Tim's point, kind of kind of just playing on that a little bit. Mm-hmm. But there's no denying it's a lot of money. Do we do we remember what the twenty years edition went for? Wasn't it somewhere around like fifty thousand euros or so, or fifty or fifty-five? Good had it somewhere around there. It was fifty-five, but let me look. So I mean, they're they're definitely. I keep coming back to the price. It's definitely a, a pricey the little. The twenty golf. years edition in Europe was fifty-nine thousand nine hundred ninety-five euros. So I, I, I don't think is... I have any. 
I don't think I have anything else to see on that. This this is not going to make me sound like more of an old man than I already am. (laughs) (laughs) There are golf buyers out there who will love it, who will appreciate it. I applaud you on that. Um, It looks fantastic. I wish it wasn't quite so expensive. I'll just leave it at that. I'll be the diplomatic guy. You know, they're going to sell all 333. It's not like this is a super mass produced vehicle. They're Mm going to find 333 people who want to buy these, whether they're buying it as an investment, whether they're Mm -hmm. going to buy it and enjoy it and put it on the road for whatever reason, 333 is such a small production run. Yep. That number of buyers certainly exists. Mm -hmm. And I love group FBC points out to 80 grand. That's a new ZR2 Bison plus a base golf. <laughs> <laughs> not wrong. But if we all, but if we all made these financial decisions just based on logic, mm-hmm. life would be no fun. Yeah, I, uh, I confess, I don't know that any of the cars we talked about so far are are made for my budget. Yeah, <laughs> same. <laughs> well, you're you're talking to the guy with a 125th scale Chrysler Concorde diecast car. Look at that sitting right there. That's that's where my well, mindset is these days. Tim, I, I I really appreciate you for joining us tonight. And now yep. it is your time to shine because, like I said at the beginning of the show, you talked to Chris Benjamin, who is the head of design for Scout Motors. They are Volkswagens. Um, Smith, you and I talked about Scout when they we first, yep. they first announced them. Um, Scout is going to have an SUV and a pickup. They're going to be an electric brand. And Volkswagen has kind of positioned them kind of sort of as its own deal. They get to design cars themselves. They get to build cars themselves. They're still under the Volkswagen umbrella, but you know, they're, they're kind of off getting to, you know, play around with some fun stuff. And Tim, yeah. um, Please. It's your time to shine. Tell us a little bit about what you talked to Chris about. And I think we'll throw some questions at you as you go. For sure. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely do. But uh, yeah, I was lucky to speak with Chris Benjamin uh, last week, actually ahead of the news dropping on uh, Tuesday uh, of his uh, appointment to Scout as their chief design officer. So as you said, Scout is um, effectively a spinoff of Volkswagen. It, it's it's interesting. It feels a little bit of, um, they feel a little bit more independent than the rest of the Volkswagen brands, at least right now. Um, but we'll see how that comes together. Um, there will be technology sharing between Scout and Volkswagen platforms, motors, drive trains, that kind of thing. Um, but the exact nature of that kind of remains to be seen. But for sure, um, you know, Volkswagen really wants, it feels like Volkswagen really wants Scout to have its own identity, its own feel. Um, and certainly Scout's got a strong American heritage that they want to bring into t- the table, uh, which is, of course, really important here in the U.S., especially in the off-road scene. Um, and so that's what Scout's really trying to capitalize on. And so Chris Benjamin coming from Stellantis, um, really f- focusing on the interior design of a lot of the recent Jeeps, um, including the 2024 Wrangler. Um, that's, you know, right in their wheelhouse. That's exactly the kind of experience that that Scout really wants to bring to the table. And, and interestingly, the... Um, a lot of what we talked about was, was tactility, um, and that's something that is lacking in a lot of EVs, especially you know if we talk about Volkswagen, the ID4. Um, when that first came out, one of the big complaints that I had, and a lot of other people as well, was, was the, the lack of tactility. You know, touch sensitive buttons here and there. Um, there were uh, a distinct lack of things that you could actually touch and feel. Everything was touchscreen based. Everything was capacitive touch. Um, the steering wheel, in particular, all the controls on there were just really hard to use because it was hard to tell. You know what was volume up, what was cruise control, what was the uh, the D pad for not uh, toggling through the the gauge cluster, that kind of thing. Um, and Volkswagen has since addressed that for sure. But um, but really, when you talk about off road vehicles and vehicles that are really strong performing off road, like the Bison we talked about earlier, um, there's generally a desire for strong tactility and kind of a, a, a kind of a chunky feel. And so we talked about that quite a bit. Um, the changes that they made in the Wrangler that Chris's team made in the Wrangler to make that a little bit stronger and a little bit how that's going to apply going forward um, as he now brings his skills and, and a lot of experience to uh, to, to, to scout. Um, Chris has got a really interesting portfolio and his career yeah. was um, – was great sure. starting with Mercedes Benz and then moving forward to Volvo. Uh, he did uh, the V40, which is one of the best looking Volvos of all time. Um, and uh, sadly, uh, a Volvo that we never got here in the US. Uh, but then from there, went on to Stellantis and did um, uh, did the Grand Wagoneer interior, which I think uh, we can all agree is fantastic too. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's definitely a great sign for Scout interiors. But, um, but Chris will also be, of course, working on exterior design as well. And um, yeah, um, the other thing that he he and I talked about a lot was um, respecting the the heritage of Scouts, um, but also not being trapped in the past. 
Um, you, you know, we've seen Ford bringing back the Bronco and doing a great job of creating a, you know, a, a, a look and feel that honors the, the past, but also feels uh, fresh. And so I'm really curious to see um, what, what Chris and team can do for, for the Scouts um, product before. You know, the Scout 2, I think, came out in 72. Um, and then they had uh, the Terra truck and a few other products that, that ultimately all ended in, uh, in 1980 when, when Scout folded. So they've got 40 years of time to kind of make up and to bring that brand 40 years into the future. And, and yeah, I'm really excited to see what those look like and, and, and ultimately how they drive. Well, let so me just I ask you, curious. Oh. <laughs> uh, we're, we're both curious. Why don't you go first? Good, sir. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I was curious um, and you, you touched on this just a little bit with what you were mm -hmm. saying. So I, I hope you can kind of go into some more detail. Sure. Is that, so what we've seen of scout so far, you know, the, basically we've only seen kind of shadowy drawings and profiles yeah. and stuff like that is that, it is definitely taking on the retro modern type of look. Like there is a distinct similarity to the earlier scout vehicles and, you know, the international Harbor scout, you know, the, those vehicles, but it also still looks modern. And I was curious, did you get to talk to Chris at all about how you balance that? Because so I own a 2006 Mini Cooper, you know, the, mm -hmm. which is amongst that kind of generation. You had the New Beetle, the Mini, the yep. Ford Thunderbird. You know, th there were a ton of vehicles at that time. The what the HHR is that? No, anyway, the the Chevy. That yeah, I think it was HHR. Yep. Yeah. Yep. That tried to kind of do that retro look in a modern way, and some of them succeeded, and some of them failed and mm -hmm. it, you know it, it and it's a very to me it's a it's a tight rope you have to walk like you can't go too far into the past and you can't change things too much either did you get to talk to him about any of that and how he intends to balance those things yeah we, we spoke quite a bit about that and, and that's really again getting back to the idea of of scouts um you know going dormant for 40 years and so them having to, to make up for 40 years of time um they've actually done a number of um feedback groups with with scout owners there's a, a huge community of, of really dedicated scout owners particularly oh, yeah. on the west coast and so they've done kind of um design feedback and study feedback with with some of those hardcore users and uh and chris said that the feedback that they get by and large when they ask those uh you know those classic scout owners what do they want to see uh they basically said they want a, a truck that looks exactly like their truck from you know from 1972 um but but ultimately chris said that that's not really what he wants to bring to market uh, he wants right. to honor that design but bring it forward uh, in terms of you know giving me any any sneak peeks or details you know i, I think we can expect that the, the headlight shape that, that kind of iconic round headlights to make some kind of an indication there um but beyond that it, it's a little hard to say the one thing that he did say was that um scouts kind of have a um uh, a heritage of of open air motoring, um, you know, much mm -hmm. like much like the Wrangler does, and so um, that's something that he said that they want to bring to the table. But interestingly, he said he wants to to bring the experience of open air motoring to to their vehicles without some of the the pitfalls. I think he said that other manufacturers have seen, and he kind of was. Um, uh, indirectly referencing some of the issues that Ford has had with their hard tops and, and certainly, you know, the, um, the Wrangler tops have traditionally not been that easy to operate. So I think we'll see some interesting innovations on the front there. I'm curious if we'll even see something like a folding windscreen, because that's something that some scouts had um, that might be maybe being a little bit too optimistic, especially for a vehicle um, of that weight that you'll need to provide a, a good amount of yeah. rollover protection, that kind of thing. Uh, but certainly he said open air motoring. And, and so he wants to kind of honor the, um, in addition to honoring that that classic design, he wants to honor kind of the um, the classic expectations, the classic use cases that people had back then and the kind of fun mm -hmm. things that people would do with their scouts as much as the, the kind of the, the fun and, and funky styling of, of those things too. So I'm curious to see how that all comes together. But no, he, he unfortunately would not um, slip me in any sketches or, or sneak peeks or anything like that. We still got to wait a little bit longer for that. Well, that's that, that's one thing that I was actually going to ask you about that you kind of touched on there a little bit. You mentioned in your article where he was talking about a design that was less fundamentally compromised. And I love that <laughs> passage than Bronco yeah. or Jeep. And yeah, there it definitely felt like he was giving a little poke to uh, the roof issues that that Ford was having uh, with the Bronco. Yeah, you, yeah, for did, sure. Did, did, did you I mean, did you get a sense that 
it went beyond that a reference maybe to like to like some of the the reports of of the wranglers with the death wobble you know with the solid axle up front on that yeah Um, we we talked quite a bit about his design influences and his um his his time at brands like mercedes-benz and volvo um and so he's really bringing an interestingly international perspective to the table here obviously this is an american brand and scour really wants to lean on on that heritage um but he said he wants these cars to drive as well as, as a european car he wants them to be as reliable as a Japanese car. And that's kind of playing into, you know, automotive cliches to some degree. I think that, you know, American cars drive as well as European cars these days. But but ultimately, you know, if you think about that heritage, um, that points to something that is going to be a significantly different driving experience than your average Wrangler. Uh, you know, you hop in a Wrangler, you drive to the store, it feels like you're driving a Wrangler. Uh, the Bronco is definitely a step forward in that regard. But even so, if you drive, uh, you know, a Bronco versus a Bronco Sport, you can tell that one is a very different experience than the other. Um, so, you know, Chris made no bones about the fact that this is going to be an incredibly comprehensive, um, well-performing off-road vehicle, and I have no doubt about that. But if you drive, for example, a Rivian R1T or an R1S, um, those are vehicles that drive really nicely. They have great on-road manners. Um, they may be a little bit sloppy and floaty, but then again, they're really large Chevy EVs, and they're very comfortable to drive in, but yet you take those things off-road, and they're absolute monsters. Uh, and I think that that's something that that um, Scout is looking to bring to the table for these things. Things that can be comfortable, legitimately comfortable on-road vehicles, things that you can take your kids to school with and not have them, uh, you know, bouncing out of the back seats or, or deaf from the wind whistling around the, uh, the the soft top, that kind of thing. Uh, but then hit the trails on the weekend and keep up with absolutely anything out there. I think that's the idea. And that's something that, again, outside of something that's on the really high end premium side like a Rivian, we haven't really seen that before. And, you know, Scout's promising to have something in the $40,000 range. So something that is legitimately attainable um, to have something that will be that high performing, um, but also be uh, something that's comfortable and livable and something that's also high tech at a attainable price point. I'm, you know, I'm really excited to see how that comes together. Um, we're still a couple of years away, so I'm, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if that price creeps up a little bit, but, uh, but I'm, I'm definitely bullish and I'm excited about it. And let me just give a quick shout out to everybody listening. Um, of course, you can join us live in the conversation, Motor One Com on Facebook, Motor One on YouTube, Motor One Com on Twitter. Uh, you're catching us on audio, Spotify, um, Apple, iHeartRadio, Deezer. Um, and the article that we're referencing, Tim wrote this article. You can go over to MotorOne.com. Scout's new head of design brings Jeep back- background to brand reboot. A little bit of a tongue twister there. Nice uh, nice headline. I appreciate that. Um, you can go check that, that out over MotorOne.com. So, so, so much information here. Um, a little bit more on the design because I found your intro to this article very interesting. And it kind of ties in to the Colorado ZR2 Bison a little bit where <laughs> there's this yeah. trend of just bigger, beefier, more wild, more rugged, more off-road. And I, I think I think you describe here if this trend continues, eventually we're all just going to look like we're in a Mad Max <laughs> dystopian society where all, where all of these wild styles come in. But the impression I got from your interview is, is that Chris doesn't really want to go in that direction. He wants to, he, he, he's not looking at this big kind of burly. I mean, traditionally scout was very much a, a competitor to the, to the older Jeep and the Bronco mm-hmm. back in the day. Yep. In theory, to be that way now, you're going to have to go a little bit more rugged. But it sounds like they want to take it maybe, maybe a little, a little in the direction of Land Rover. Maybe. I, I think it's a question of capability versus um, aesthetic and um, attitude. If anything, and it's really I think the attitude is what Chris wants to change, and I think that's something that Scott Keogh wants to change as well. The CEO of, of Scott Motors. Um, they want these to be approachable cars. Uh, they don't want to be, you know, mean. Uh, and I think that's what the, that's the aesthetic that a lot of off-roaders go for: a mean car, uh, you know, an opposing car, something that is, you know, that that owners at least think is an intimidating thing, whether it be angry eyes on Wranglers or, um, you know, big red um, slashes in graphics on your Raptor R, that kind of thing. Um, that's really not what they're going for. They want. Uh, as far as I can tell, Scouts will be as capable as as all those products. Maybe not as fast, but but you know that that capable in terms of off roading. But they don't want them to be kind of off putting or um, 
there's this this whole idea of what is a scout. That's something that I, I got to speak with Scott Keo a few months ago. And um, he said that it's really important to the brand is the idea of, of being a scout. And that is kind of being, um, he, he described it as basically being a, a good representative of of, um, of the culture, of, of pushing forward the idea of being helpful, of exploring, of getting out there, of enjoying nature. But not like tearing through nature, not dominating things, not you know planting your flag and, and, and claiming a space or, or intimidating anybody else, but being kind of good stewards to to the world as you are and getting out there and exploring, which is a very different attitude than we see when we see a lot of um, you know that Hennessy Raptors and that kind of thing just jumping off of dunes and and making a big mess and that kind of thing. And don't get me wrong, I, I respect and appreciate the performance of those vehicles for sure. But it's really, if nothing else, is the attitude that, that I think Chris wants to change: the idea of being good stewards and and having a vehicle that is approachable um, but still incredibly capable. You mean so? So in other words, no six by six scouts, probably. <laughs> I mean, we'll see what Hennessy's up to. They we'll, we'll they, they do we'll some see. fun things. <laughs> So I was curious. Um, so we know Scout is going to do a pickup truck and an SUV as their first two products. They've been very, yeah. very clear about that. Um, were you able to get any sort of idea about how they're going to differentiate the design between those two? And I can, um, for anyone watching on YouTube, for anyone watching the video version of this, I can show you exactly what I mean. And that is that some scouts if you look at them they have that this suv body with this upward mm -hmm. kink and it it keeps it from looking like it's a pickup truck with just a bed mm -hmm. on you know with a bed capper on the back uh, you can see it here versus other models they have this very boxy appearance um and i was just wondering did you get any idea what how they intend to differentiate the look of those two models no, uh, really, I think too early to talk too much detail about that kind okay. of thing, unfortunately. So no, I wasn't able to get anything like that. Uh, but I know that the truck will be larger, uh, much like the Rivian truck is larger than their SUV. Um, so I think that, that will obviously be some something a visual differentiator. Um, but but no, yeah, as you mentioned, the, I think it's the the, uh, the Terra, I think, was their, uh, the former SUV. And that definitely has a different vibe to it than the Scout 2 of the time. And uh, and I do hope that they can kind of bring a different kind of attitude um, to the two products to differentiate them more than just a little bit of length and obviously an open bed. Um, yeah. But no, I, I don't know. Um, I don't know exactly what else they're going to do to differentiate the two. I know the truck will also be a little bit pricier, which will be another differentiator. But visually, oh, I'm not sure. OK, I don't think I heard that before. OK, cool. Well, I mean, Groove FBC says it all here. There is so much potential here for stripe packages. I think Scout would would it would be a huge swing and a miss if they don't at least offer some of these retro yeah. stripe packages. Yeah. It would it would fit in. I mean, no, no big like R's with slashes through them. But just I mean, I think some of these classic packages, like the uh, like like the red with just the white striping that goes along the side, kind of breaks down. I mean that. It would translate to a to a nice modern, I think a or nice even, modern yeah. like we're, SUV. Shape. We're, like we're seeing in some of these photos, a two tone look with a you know a white roof with a mm -hmm. different colored body. That you know even that is it. It's vaguely retro, but you know you still see vehicles doing it today, mm -hmm. and it's it's a neat look. Yeah, uh, this orange and white package in particular, I, I think is gorgeous, and, and I do hope that they can tap into that to some degree because there are so many boring color combinations out there on a lot of cars right now and it would it'd be lovely to see some of this i think ford's doing a great job with the bronco too uh, of bringing some of this this taste back and i think this is such a strong heritage but as you look through these cars i mean none of these cars look intimidating anyway they all look kind of friendly they all look like yeah know, people are out there having a good time and, and that's really from what i've gotten the the sense or the vibe of the current scout culture as well a lot of them again are west coast california live in kind of fun things to take down to the beach with a surfboard on top that kind of thing um, which again is a very different attitude than your average, uh, or, or from what I see around here anyway, your average Wrangler owner with the angry eyes in the front to go with, you know, mud up the sides and, uh, and um, you know, skull and crossbones, and that kind of thing. So I, I think that that's going to be a big differentiation for them. I do hope that they have some cool 70s graphics package because that's, um, that's definitely a missed opportunity. I totally agree there. By the way, yeah. for anyone watching, I love these two, this dark green and gold, and then this pickup truck, like, the, these two are my favorites of this gallery that we have uh, mm -hmm. just personally the uh, the um, red the red with the white stripe that's just uh, begging. oh this one uh, yeah that right there that's just begging to be brought back and i mean you could almost make that 
you could almost make that a, just a two tone finish. Right. Sure. And I think that that right there, it sets it apart from Wrangler and Bronco. I mean, you have Bronco, you have the, the, the retro package where you're getting the red letter. That's pretty neat. But that's, that is such an identifiable portion of scout history that with the little up kink to the window at the back. Yeah. It's, mm -hmm. it's refreshing to hear that they're thinking not in terms of bigger, burlier, meaner, as you've been saying, Tim, yeah. but something that's still capable, still completely capable of taking you off road wherever you want to go, but you just don't have to be all shouty about it. I guess that's probably maybe the best way to describe it. Yeah. And what's more intimidating than somebody who's better than you at something, but who does it with a big smile on their face. I mean, that's, that's, I think exactly what they want to be. <laughs> and you were mentioning, so Chris Benjamin, obviously he, he, he kind of started out with interior design and then, you know, has gone elsewhere. It really makes me hope that, and you said he was talking about functionality and usability. It makes me hope that there are, you know, big chunky buttons and switches and stuff like that. Like, I, I, hey, I have got a car with a touchscreen. Touchscreen has totally has its place, but sometimes buttons are the right thing too. It just depends on the application and where you put them. Um, but yeah, yeah, he, he specifically called out HVAC controls. There'll be dedicated buttons and, and knobs for those. Volume knob, he explicitly said there will be one of those two. Um, and he, he actually, you know, we, we talked a bit about uh, the work on the Wrangler, and he called out the the shifter for, um, you know, for high, for low, that kind of thing. And he, he talked about the, the tactility and the chunkiness of that shifter and how much attention that that got when they were putting that together. And then, you know, transition from there to talk about some of the physical controls that they'll have in, in this guy. Now, presumably, there won't be, you know, a four high, four low shifter in the scout because it's all going to be more right. power train so they won't have to worry about exactly. that um but he, he mentioned that as kind of something that was important to the the kind of the ethos or the the feel of the wrangler and, and wanting to bring um that kind of similar sort of tactility that kind of uh, precision to to the, the the scout motors as well so yeah i think it's going to be a really interesting blend of of that kind of um uh not exactly old school, but classic tactility. But yet, you know, I, I I did corner him and ask him explicitly, will there be Android Auto? Will there be Apple CarPlay? And he said, yes, there will be both. There will be touchscreen with all, all the modern conveniences that you come to expect. Yeah. Well, I feel like every automaker at this point, they're, they're taking a little moment to maybe jab at GM a little bit for their big announcement. <laughs> saying, we're we're going to phase it. It seems like every time I turn around, I get a comment from somebody somewhere saying, Oh no, we're we're still going to have Apple CarPlay and Android Auto in our in our vehicles going forward. These are what people want. Why would we want to take that away from them? And uh, right. um, hearing hearing the tactile controls, I I think there's there's more. I think mm -hmm. automakers are seeing more pushback now uh, from mm -hmm. buyers it, mm -hmm. in terms of just burying so many things that should be very very simple, two or three screens deep into a touchscreen, where just a simple button or a switch can make the difference. I understand the, uh, the aesthetics of a nice clean sheet of paper, if you will, for an interior. Um, there's, there's something pleasing about that, but a few logically placed controls neatly arranged. That looks pleasing too. Um, yeah. it, I mean, to with, me, with... it's like automakers or to me, it seems like designers thought everyone lives in this ideal world where it's, 70 degrees all the time but for a large portion of the population hey it gets cold in the winter and i gotta wear gloves yeah. and your touch screen does not work when i'm wearing gloves so <laughs> you know that's well i blame iron man for all of that <laughs> okay. i mean i mean iron man goes up to his table right that like like you get in the in the first movie there and it's just like his holographic table everything's nice and clean and neat, and boop, 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 and you just start doing all those holographics yeah i blame just blame Iron Man. Yeah. Deal. He saved he saved the universe from Thanos. I don't care. <laughs> um, I don't care. And Group FBC, another good point. Ford reversed their decision to remove AM radio. I see GM reversing their non carplay decision to I you know I, so. no, I, I wish I were so optimistic. Yeah, I, I'm not I'm not happen. sure. I'm not sure. I mean, when you start talking about like like designs and future tech, the things that they're mentioning now. Those were in the works at least a year or two ago, if not much yeah. further. Mm -hmm. If they want to, if they do reverse course, it probably won't be right away. 
but you, you never know that there, there's certainly been a lot of negative feedback um, yes. from people on that, but maybe GM system will, will come out and, and work better as their advertising. We'll have to wait and see on that. Yeah. So Tim, we're kind of sort of finishing up, but I am actually really curious. Where do you f- fall in the Android auto Apple car play? Yes. No GM kind of um, debate. Oh yeah. I'm definitely pro um, mobile interface. Uh, I- I'm an Android guy myself. So I'm Android team Android auto, but uh, certainly Apple car play offers much the same experience. So yeah, I think that that's a really important thing. Manufacturers had every opportunity to develop amazing in cars, uh, infotainment systems and by and large, they screwed up. Uh, they failed to do so. And so they, they gave up that early mover advantage. They gave up that opportunity to, to provide that kind of functionality to, uh, to their users and at this point, they've missed the boat. I think for them to try to capture that or recapture that again, it would be really incredibly difficult. So for Chevrolet to, or for GM, I should say, excuse me, to um, to provide that same degree of functionality, to provide the same amount of insight into your life that your phone already has to, to, to replicate that, to me, seems absolutely impossible. Um, so I'm, I'm not optimistic that, that that experience that's going to be brought forth is going to be in any way um, comparable or, or as, as user-satisfying as either Android Auto or Apple CarPlay. So, yeah, that's, that's my thoughts on the subject. And I can't remember yeah, I, the, re- the, the report specifically that I saw. I'm trying to remember the automaker that it came from. But, but it was a case of these, these other tech companies, they're already handling these solutions – that we don't need to focus on as automakers anymore. We can we can focus on just working with their systems. It's easier on that end. It's what the consumer wants. We can focus then on other aspects of of connectivity of technology. Um, so it it was certainly a strange decision when GM came out and said we're going to phase this out. And I mean, it's important to remember they said it, it'll be phased out in stages. Um, I, I, I can't remember offhand which vehicles it'll it'll be absent on at uh, at first. Um, it'll EVs, start with their EVs. E, yeah, yeah, EVs mm-hmm. primarily. So maybe there's a little bit of a of a, of a buffer zone there. Well, we'll just have to, have to see what the future holds, right? Yeah, absolutely. Tim, can I ask you one last question here? Um, yeah, uh, this because I mean you had a great interview. Um, Thank you. And, and, and great insight here in, into Scout Motors. And it's certainly on the minds of a lot of people, especially uh, the off-road community. Um, I knew a guy in high school that drove around in an old international Scout. Just a lot of character, a lot of mm-hmm. love. Mm-hmm. Um, was there anything about this interview that surprised you that maybe you didn't expect to hear or, or learn or, or just a, something surprising in the whole process of of talking with Chris on this? Um, I think uh, the, the uh, again, the, that core idea of, of, of being an approachable kind of f- almost friendly SUV, I think that was an interesting, um, interesting revelation to me for sure that um, that that's really c- a conscious decision that they're making that they want to bring that forward in the design of the vehicle. So yeah, that um, I think that was probably the most surprising thing that came out of it for me. Okay. Yeah, I mean, and it's a suit point too. If you want to be different than everybody else, what I mean, the trend is certainly bigger, better, meaner, more aggressive. If you want to stand out, go the yeah. opposite direction. Yeah. When's the last time you saw a new truck launch that was smaller and more friendly than the one that came before it? And yeah. it's uh, it's been a while. Yeah. I mean, we're talking about mid-sized trucks today that were full-size trucks what 15, 20 years yeah, ago. Not that long ago. Less than that. Ten. Yeah. For sure. Um, so again, we're finishing up here, but Tim, you said you stopped, you talked to Scott Keogh, uh previously about Scout and what kind of impressions did you get from him from the brand? Because obviously, Chris, he's designing the cars, but Scott Keogh, he's running the brand. Did they kind of did you get a similar feel that they're kind of seeing eye to eye in terms of where the what they want to do with this revived brand? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yes, Scott definitely has that that same idea of, of again defining what a scout is and and what that what that means, what that's going to mean to the market. And, and they have this, you know, on one hand a great opportunity, but also uh, a pretty big challenge of of yeah. bringing this iconic brand back to market, but also bringing a brand that has been dormant for forty years and that a lot of people have never heard of. I, I asked exactly. a couple of friends that's... of mine um, over, over the past um, 
a couple of days since I did this interview, if they'd ever heard of Scout and, and nobody actually had even heard of Scout. Wow. Certainly nobody had heard of, of this reboot. I think those of us in the, in the automotive community are, are aware of them. Um, but outside of that, it's it's kind of green field. Um, so they have this really interesting opportunity to kind of tie into the old marketing and the old, um, you know, some of these great images that we're seeing now uh, to kind of help to build what this brand ethos needs to be. But they have this great opportunity to really um, uh, do their own thing with it, which I think, I think, uh, from what I could tell, Chris is very excited about that. Scott's very excited about that. And, and yeah, they're definitely in, in the same vision again, that, that idea of creating an approachable car company, an incredible incredibly capable cars, um, but also attainable cars, much more so than we see from Rivian. And um, and hopefully, you know, cars that, that can draw on all the, the engineering expertise that, that comes from the uh, the broader Volkswagen group. So cars that will be, you know, reliable and, and, and everything else that we want them to be too. So yeah, I, I definitely think that they're in lockstep there. And Scott's got some great vision for the company, I think as well, the way that he's building the company, the people he's hiring, the, the way that he's hiring them. Uh, from what I've seen, everything seems to be pointing in the right direction. Well, I mean, anything that gets us more 70s style press photos. <laughs> I mean, oh, the, God, that yeah. era, that's like, it's like a golden <sighs> age of press photos. Yeah. Yeah. Never mind the, never mind the amount of orange vehicles with yellow striping or vice versa. Mm -hmm. Just uh, Bruce and I keep, keep uh, threatening to do an episode where we're just talking about 70s. We're going to do that photos. someday, man. We're, we're, it doesn't yeah. really work for Spotify, though. It doesn't really work for our it audience. Doesn't, mm -hmm. But the fact that we are we a live love show it, now, it. Yep. we could do it now that we are a live show because we have people commenting and they could comment with us and they could even throw their own out and stuff maybe, like that. Maybe, I think, I maybe. Think the time is getting closer for the <laughs> the all weird 70s press I was say, <laughs> maybe we do rambling about cars, that 70s show edition. Where it's exactly. it's a special it's a special edition in addition to our weekly podcast. I show up wearing a big curly wig, or maybe I just or maybe I just get out the blow dryer and go for it. I don't know. And uh, and we go over seventies photos. Tim, would there you join you us for that? Sounds like a good time. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that's going to be our show for tonight. And with that, Tim, I want you to go ahead and promote uh, anything Open that mic. you want to promote, whether it's social media, whether it's work you've done, whether it's something you find cool, just promote. And, promote and tell stuff, us what man. you got coming up, too. Great. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I definitely hope that folks who are listening will go go check out this article. Uh, I'm really happy with how it came together, and I think there is some really good insight into what's coming from Scout. But yeah, if you want to hear more from me, you can uh, follow my Substack. It's timstevens.substack.com. Uh, I'm yeah. Tim underscore Stevens. If y'all are still hanging on Twitter, or you can find me, uh, I'm um, at Tim Stevens at most other platforms, Instagram and Blue Sky and um, Mastodon and and pick your pick your social media flavor of the week but otherwise uh, i'm actually going off to uh lamar here um next weekend so there'll Ooh. be some coverage uh, from lamar coming for some from various sites uh on an internet near you coming soon very cool very, very good cool. sounds sounds like a fun trip i hope it uh, should be all I right it, I, I hope it goes amazing yeah amazingly well <laughs> See, have, what you happens? To, have you been I, to lamar before Mm -hmm. uh, I have, yeah. I, I went with Nissan in 2016 or 17, whenever they had that fateful year with the basically front wheel drive uh, prototype that didn't Ooh, go so well. So, you so went uh, a bad year where didn't it that was car a, do two laps. No, it did. I uh, did a few more than that, but uh, yeah, okay. that was an interesting year for sure. Uh, I'm going with Porsche this year, so they've obviously got some pretty high expectations, and, and I'm, I'm definitely curious yeah. to see how that goes. Okay, for sure. Well, thanks so um, much, Tim, for being here. Thanks everybody out there for listening. Just one last reminder. Motor One Com on Facebook, Motor One Com Twitter, Motor One on YouTube. That's where you can catch us live every Wednesday, 7 30 p.m. Eastern Time. And then our audio goes up every Friday at 10 a.m. approximately. Sometimes we're a little earlier, but usually around 10 a.m. Spotify, iHeartRadio, Deezer, Amazon, Apple, and like a dozen others that uh that that we can't even remember the names of so many, so many ways to get rambling about cars. Absolutely. And uh, for everyone out there, good afternoon, good evening, good night, and good morning to Grupa FBC out there in Australia. Uh, we love all of our listeners. We love the fact that you decided to spend time with us to, you know, of the myriad of ways that you could be listening to different shows, playing different things, whatever, that you decided to choose us. We appreciate that and we love that. Um, but yeah, that will be the show for this week and it's been a lot of fun. And so bye-bye everybody. We'll see you. Bye-bye.